Where do you want me? I can stay here. Brilliant. All right, you guys do your thing. Thanks, uh, puppeteers. You uh, made my job easier. Well, like they told us, we are today going to start something that most of us, I'm guessing, never intended to do in all their life, which is study through the book of Leviticus. <laughs> all right, so the plan is between now and May to take a look at this this Old Testament book, the next book in the series, as we move kind of chronologically through, well, as we move from the beginning of our, our Bibles, um, actually a, a, a journey we began about four years ago, if I'm correct, in Genesis. And so the question, I think, is a valid one. Why study the book of Leviticus? Why study the book of Leviticus? It is usually where... New Year's resolutions to read the Bible come to die. You make your way through Genesis, Exodus, and then you get to the goat livers and the leprous spots, and that's usually where we run out of steam. Um, plus the fact that actually it is about another different, it's a different people, it's about the Israelites in a different time, and uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a, a, a fair question. Nobody that owns a car today is reading a manual on how to take care of his horse. So why should we then study the book of Leviticus? And that's the question I just want to do to address today because I want to give us an answer to that question, but I also want to equip us and prepare us for this journey. And uh, so it's a little bit of a different sermon today, but there we go. So let's pray and uh, we'll get going. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again, for all the ministry that you are inspiring and, and empowering um, through this community. We thank you that you are communicating your word and that your word is truly um, yeah, what the disciples sought out when they heard Jesus, what they stayed around to hear, what Paul knew to be life-giving and um, what we've even experienced, Lord, to be, to be just a, a great resource to us. Lord, I pray that you would take us now through this book I pray for this today, that you would warm our hearts and encourage us, prepare us for this journey, and uh, bless just this whole study that we endeavor to take upon as we try to honor all your word and teach the whole Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I do, as I said, I want to prepare us for this study, and so actually I want to take us to another place in the Bible, first of all. I want to take us to John 17. So we're going to answer the question, why Leviticus, by starting in John 17, but just bear with me. Because as we, as we continue in our study through the Word, and as we're doing it in quite this systematic fashion, I want, us to remind, I want us to remember two things, really, that we shouldn't miss. I want to encourage us, um, before we get into the nuts and bolts, with really what is God's greatest provision. And so if you would turn to John 17 and then stand to your feet as we read God's Word. John 17 and verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to the heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Let me take your seat. But here we just go back. Let me just take you to the setting here. It's nighttime, it's dark out. It's Thursday before the first Good Friday. Jesus has crossed the brook Kidron and make his way up the Mount of Olives, Olives to a garden called Gethsemane, familiar scene. He's, with, he's got with him some of his disciples, 11, because one has left Judas to go and get the soldiers. The arrest of Jesus is just a few minutes away. And here as they make their way, there's clearly... From what Jesus has been sharing with them in the upper room, a lot of dread that they must have been experiencing and, and wonder and confusion as they make their way up, probably again to this little garden, Gethsemane. And here we see 
having, Jesus has prepared his disciples. He has uh, he's spoken to them up, up, up in the upper room about the fact that he'll be leaving them and there's, there is difficulties ahead, trials. Not just for him, but also for them. And having prepared them, he then turns around and we get this amazing chapter, John 17, of how he turns and prays to the Father. And here we see this man on his knees speaking. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. This man that's on his knees praying to the Father, it says it's praying that he may be glorified with the glory that he had with the Father in the Father's presence since before the world existed. It's an amazing, blessed thought that this one on his knees is the one who had, before even time and the world came into being, been there in the presence of God with the presence of God the Father with the glory of God. This is one God himself now as a man praying, anticipating the arrest and the death that he's about to experience. This is God here, God the Son for praying to God the Father here in this dark night. He's the one that we've been singing about that he may be glorified yet to come. And so the request is here that he be glorified, that he may be helped through really the hour of trial that's about to come. He may go through the arrest, humiliation, the, uh, the beatings, and the crucifixion, and then be laid in the tomb, and that God then would, would glorify him, raising him back to life, glorify him back to that status, that place he had before of authority. And God, and Jesus is praying this and is going through this, now I think, familiar story to most of us of East, that first Easter, so that he may provide eternal life, it says, to all whom the Father has given him. And this is the familiar gospel message. Here we see an insight into it that Jesus' substitution that he's about to, to, take, to, to go through is where he will go to the cross to take away the death that man deserves so that he may, through his resurrection then, and man's union with him through faith, may impart life, new eternal life to those. It's the wonderful gospel message that I think has to be so central that Jesus is the provider of life. And this is how he is going to glorify the Father. This is how the Father is going to be glorified. It's a reminder that it's only through the work of Christ that we may have eternal life, a familiar message, praise God, to most of us, I assume. But here also, as we see the the Father and the Son, or the Son praying to the Father, we get this amazing insight into the plan of God, this perspective that this is about the sovereign work of God down through history, because as Jesus says here, I will provide eternal life to those who you have given me. God is the one who has given a people to Jesus. God is the Father is the one who has sent Jesus, and God is the one who's going to glorify Jesus and those who through faith are united to Jesus. And Paul elsewhere, as we well, we were in Ephesians last week, Paul says that this choice of who would be given to the, fa- the Son has happened before the earth the foundations of the world. So Jesus, God the Father is the one who chose. God the Father is the one who gave. God the Father is the one who sent Jesus. God the Father is the one who will glorify Jesus and all those that are with him. It gives us an amazing picture that this is all the sovereign plan of God. God is the provider. This is about God's grace. And as we go back, even to somewhere like Leviticus, I thought it would be great just again to get an insight into the fact that this whole book is an account of God at work, a reminder that it's a sovereign God who's in charge. At this hour, as Jesus says, the hour that God has been working up to, ever since Genesis 3.15, where he promised that he would send one, that there would be one that would come in the seed of woman to crush the head of the serpent. Here we see the hour has come. John, even earlier in, his, in, in this gospel, said the hour is not yet, speaking to Mary when he was turning the water into wine. 
Chapter 7, the hour is not yet. Chapter 8, the hour is not yet. Chapter 12, the hour is coming. And here, the hour has come. This is what it's been building to. This is the climax of the story so far, the cross. And I think, picture from this perspective that God is in control. God is the provider. Jesus is the one who accomplished it. And even in this moment, this dark night, in apparent defeat, and the forces of evil, when Satan seemed to have the upper hand, it was God's great victory that he was working. He was through sending and the dying of Jesus and the raising of Jesus, providing life to those undeserving ones who would simply respond in faith. So I think as we turn to Leviticus and look at, again, continue our story, our journey through the Old Testament, I thought it'd be great again to reinforce and just Proclaim again this gospel message that we need to constantly be reminded of. The world needs to know that we should not get lost in the detail too much. We know what it's anticipating. We know that so much of the Old Testament is prophesying, looking forward to this one, this king, who would first come here as we see to die, to provide life, and then is yet to come, looking further ahead, is coming back to rule, and we've been singing about those great truths. And so I think... We should not get lost in the detail. And we remember this is a whole picture, a whole story of God's grace, God's salvation. But also I think here we get to see what is that life? What is the nature of that life that he has welcomed us into? That's the greatest of all provisions that we shouldn't miss. And it's there in verse 3. This is eternal life. I wonder what you think eternal life is. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the great provision for us. We might think of eternal life that Jesus provided as not going to hell. Instead, going to be with, going to be in heaven, going to be on the new earth. And that's true. We may even think of eternal life in terms of destination, but actually Jesus says at the heart of it, It's knowing God. It's intimacy with the one true God. It's experiencing God. And so, again, as we go into the Old Testament, we continue our, yeah, I think long journey was probably based on how much content there is here. We need to remember that greatest of all provisions, that it's about knowing God. And as Christians, for those of us who now have the assurance that we will forever be, we have God and we will forever be with Him. I want us to remember not just that this is a plan of God's grace, but this is a very personal relationship and experience that we can have now. And that we should seek to know Him better. See, it's possible to read and not to pray. That doesn't help human relationships. My wife complains that sometimes she's talking and I'm listening, but I'm not responding. <laughs> doesn't help very much. But aren't we to, as we read, isn't this God speaking to us? And if this is about knowing God, then isn't it natural that there's a, continue, a return, a prayer unto Him? It's possible to grow in knowledge and not respond in praise. So I just thought it would be great as we begin, as I turn now to that question, why Leviticus? To start with this picture here in this dark night, this man who was the glorious one from all eternity past, kneeling on the ground, going to the cross, Remind us of this is about God's grace. And this, for us now, Christians at least, is now an opportunity to grow to know him better as we look at his word. Well, our TBT, so the puppets mentioned it, is through the Bible together. It's just kind of our philosophy, shall we say, on um, our approach to word ministry here. We have a little phrase, um, I don't know if we're very good wordsmiths, but we have a little phrase and you'll notice it on your TBT apps, where the the music, the memory verse songs are published. It says, uh, wait, where I have to find it now? Yeah, a journey through scripture to know God better. That's what it is, a journey through scripture to know God better, a journey best traveled together. So it just reminds us what we read there in, in, in John 17, that we welcome the opportunity to approach even a book like Leviticus because it gives us an opportunity. It's God's revelation to know God better. But even zooming out and considering the fact that the Old Testament, 
That might even be a question for some of us. Why study the Old Testament? I read a book not too long ago by, um, just over a year ago by Walter Kaiser, a book about rediscovering the Old Testament, where he bemoans the fact that there are people since even the second, second century and even as re- recent as this last century who would believe that the Old Testament has no authority over us today. The Old Testament, and they would cut it off and cut it up There are those even in Christianity who believe that if we were to get rid of the Old Testament, that would help us, that we would remove a lot of the objections that atheists or or non-Christian friends have. And then there's even the more widespread attitude that relegates the Old Testament to kind of an appendix behind the new. I want to encourage us that the Old Testament is, as the puppet said, the Word of God breathed out by God. And so what it really is, as we've discovered it since we began about four years ago, a story about how God is relating to this chosen people, these Israelites. It is not that there is one God of the Old Testament and another of the New, for as Hebrews 1 calls us, that God spoke in times past in various ways, speaking about the Old Testament revelation. And then today, in these latter times, He has spoken through Jesus Christ. So there is one God speaking. One God in both making himself known, and as I said, he's doing it. He's doing it by giving us the record of how he relates to this chosen people. This is that people, the Israelites. And no, they are not the same as us, the church and Israel. We hold that they are different, but it's the same God. It might give you an encouragement, what we're seeing in this interaction, in this relationship that's recorded for us, is put put before us the character of God and also the nature of man. The character of God and the nature of man. We've seen from Genesis the story so far about God the creator, God the one who wants to relate, God the one who is grieved by sin. If you remember him speaking to Noah before the flood, one who actually draws near and condescends to be a friend of somebody like Abraham who experiences, who is somehow moved with our obedience, as we see in the account of Abraham, who chose obedience to God over his love of family, and he offered Isaac. God says, now I I know that you love me. I know that you fear me. We see a sovereign God even over the disobedience of the brothers of of, of Joseph, and how God used, intended what they intended for evil, God intended for good. And we see him, um, of course, as a God who chooses. He chose Abraham. He initiates his plan to redeem, to bless, by choosing Abraham. And there is Abraham amongst all the nations, people of different languages. He chooses and he creates his own nation. This old man, he gives him a son and an heir. And this family through Genesis grows into a tribe and a clan and then into Exodus We've seen how it becomes a nation. And he redeemed this nation out of slavery in Egypt so that he could dwell with them. And we ended our story so far in, um, in the autumn last year where the tabernacle is erected. God is going, takes up his place in a tent amongst their tents. And he is with this people. He's relating to this people. And so if we want to see God's revelation of himself, we want to get to know him better, we want to see how he's relating to these people, and we're going to see that as we follow this story. And so it is a journey through Scripture to know God better. Now, when we finished Exodus, knowing that the next book was Leviticus, the elders decided that actually we do want to continue that story. God has given these people, he's now with them, He's given this people these promises. We want to continue. We want to travel. Go back in time and see how he is relating to this people. We want to travel on with him. See how he does take them as he promised into the land. And further, as he provides for them a king to rule over them. How he's promised that there would be a king to bring restoration and salvation. We want to see how this is all anticipating Jesus and that moment there we read in, Genesis, in, in John 17 and what it on, looks on towards in the future and the complete restoration that's promised. We want to continue in this story. 
And so this is why we're the next step is Leviticus. Now if you um, would turn with me to Exodus 40, we left that, as I said, the story off there in verse 34 with the Moses has finished the work, the tabernacle has been erected. And in the cloud, it says, verse 34, covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And the Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because of the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle throughout all their journeys. Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, and they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. That's how we left the story, this general account of how God is moving the people and being with them. Now, if you would flip with me, a little bit of a Bible study, over to, Rome, uh, to Numbers chapter 9, verse 15, you might see something quite familiar. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, verse 15, there are chapter 9 in Numbers, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony at that evening, uh, and the evening was over the tabernacle like appearance of fire until morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that the people of Israel would set out. And so it goes. This is almost a direct parallel or repeat of what we've seen there where we left off the story in Exodus 40. And so it seems that the, the narrative has paused for the whole of the book of Leviticus and for a couple of these opening chapters of Numbers. And actually, it, it, there's quite a few chapters in here, but it's quite a short period of time. We've seen in, uh, where we left off that actually the, the tabernacle was erected on the first day of the month, almost a full year after they came out of Egypt. And then here, Numbers tells us that the next 12 days were taking up with the tribes coming and bringing gifts to consecrate the tabernacle. On the 14th day of that month, Numbers 9 talks about that celebration, the first anniversary of them leaving, exiting slavery in Egypt. And in the following chapter, on the 20th day of the second month, they pack up, they leave Sinai from where they were back in Exodus, and they head on to the land. And so this period, this, this bracket, I think, that's created from that parallel repeated passage at the end of Exodus, and there in chapter 9 in Numbers, is about a month and 20 days. And that is the study for the next, was it 13 weeks, Leviticus and a couple of chapters in Numbers. It's ultimately really just a, a, a list, a list of instructions that Moses has given the children of Israel that he receives from God. It's um, a list of things that they have to do in order to live in the camp with God in their midst. And so we've kind of entitled our, our soul series, What It's Like to Be in the Camp with Yahweh. What it's like in that time to be in the camp with Yahweh. And what a wonderful insight into what the character of God and the nature of man to see what it would have been like in the camp. If I could just go over, I've got a, a little graphic for myself here. I think it's on the screen. Um, over a little bit of an overview of this whole time, just to give you an idea and to set up our study, we begin looking at some of the rituals. It's not these lists, it's not like set out in chronological order, but rather I think in themes, in a, thematically. You begin with the, the offerings, you move on to talk about the priests, then it goes to talk, you're moving this way, then it talks about the purity, the cleanliness, that's the leprous spots. And then on the flip side of this of this kind of parallel structure, you again, you talk about the purity, what it means to be a holy people in their conduct. We return to the conduct of the priests, and finally we end with some more rituals in all those festivals that they were. This was what it was to be in the camp. These are what the people were to do in order to be, live in the camp with Yahweh. And then Leviticus comes to a conclusion and numbers with some more, some more instructions specifically to do with the Levites is then preparing then to depart and go to the land. And if I was to say then why Leviticus, well it's there you get a chance to be on the ground. Yes, it's a load of details and we can, we can legitimately find some struggle in reading through it. But what a good 
to get you know, a good insight and a good opportunity to get down to the day-by-day stuff. What it's like to be, to know this God in that time. So we get to see, you know, if I was to take the, the narrative up to this point through Exodus, it's like a bird's eye view. You get to see from a distance, like one of those hawks hovering over the ground. We see them coming out of Egypt. We see them building the tabernacle. We see them then in numbers packing up the tabernacle and moving on. But when it comes to Leviticus, we get to be there on the ground in the tent, in the camp with them. So actually, all these details can be, it can be helpful. But I encourage, if I was to encourage, how are we now going to participate together in this? For as we said, our TBT structure is like a journey through the Bible to know God better, a journey best traveled together. How can we together as a community approach this study and how can you participate? That's how I would just like to to wrap up today. Certainly it's one thing to start a study like this in ourselves, but to do it as a community to rely on one another's gifts I think will be a great blessing. Well, I would encourage us to read through the the story, to be in the text. We will lead from the sermon each week. It sets the tone. It It will lay out what the passage that week is for. But ultimately, we want that the Word of God dwells on us richly, that we are reading and meditating on the text throughout the week. might be a good opportunity to crack out some audio Bibles and have it just running during breakfast or in the car to read and listen. And I know there are many different ways that you can approach the study of the Old Testament, and not all are helpful. And so I would commend that approach to you where you're just looking at this story, trying to get back into, be historians, get back into that historical moment when God revealed himself to those people and ask yourself, what do we see about the character of God? What do we see about the nature of man? And we really, the character of God and the nature of man, and we can anticipate then, as Leviticus helps us do, how God bridges that gap, how truly He is going to reconcile so that we may know him. And of course, not only does Leviticus show us the character of God and the nature of man, it also anticipates Christ's salvation, the salvation plan. In fact, it does it in a special way. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament will draw on a lot of the elements here in Leviticus to help us explain what Jesus did, help illustrate what Jesus has done for us. It'll help us understand sacrifice. Have you ever wondered why or ever asked yourself why, why would a man dying on a tree be an expression of love? Why would a man being killed by the state provide or impact me in any way? We need to have a grounding in what sacrifice, substitution is about. Why blood? Why not some other form of currency? These answers will be in the book of Leviticus in our study as we grow and, sp- and read it through this w- in each week. And of course, I do encourage you to come and listen to the sermons. We'll find them online if you want to re-listen to them. Um, if you want to follow, I've provided some bookmarks at the back. It will show you the text for the upcoming week. So please, every individual, take one or two. I've got plenty. You'll find them on the little chair at the back. I forgot to put a table out. And also, if, if it does help you meditate and have... Uh, just a reminder, a visual reminder in your home to be in the text. Please take a poster as, out, out way as well, and you can just hang them up on your fridge. In the past, we did these posters so that they could be some way of interacting for parents to lead the children through. Fortunately, that's not what this is going to do. <laughs> there wasn't enough time to repair it. But this is just a visual, visual reminder. So if you are or have or have not children, feel free to go and take one of these home and put it on your fridge. Say we have plenty. So how you can be involved, read and listen through the text each week. Come to Sunday worship and, and, and uh, sit under the teaching of the word. But also encourage you in the home groups and the life groups to be part because they take, take time as a community to respond, to meditate and to help one another understand the text better. And then just finally, one, one new resource that we have is uh, a podcast, or at least this is what we're trying We're trying to do a podcast, David and I, and Johnny is the producer. Any questions you have, go to him, wherever he is. But we're trying to do a podcast each week, and it will be uh, released on Thursdays. It's mostly a discussion on the text that week in a way to help stimulate more thinking and your meditation 
that the Word of God truly does dwell in you richly. Um, there'll be testimonies from time to time, but it's mostly just a discussion and a reflection on the sermon topic. So if you're interested in podcasts, listen to them. They'll be on, I think, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the usual channels. Any technical questions, don't ask me. Ask Johnny. But there you go. That's all I want to share today as we lead off in this study. I hope you've been blessed again by the insight into our Savior there on that hill. And I hope that it gives you some framework and some idea of what you can look for as you begin your study of Leviticus. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that as we do endeavor um, to apply discipline and use our time well, that you may bless us, teach us things from your word, help us know you better, help us respond and see that this is is not just dead facts on a page or ideas, but insight into the God who is and what he's done for us and a better, clear insight and, and revelation about our, our flawed nature, but your great creation as well. So Lord, I pray, bless our community. Lord, may we be people of the word. And um, yeah, thank you for this time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen.